We're joined by UT Rio Grande Valley head coach Dan Hipscher. Uh, coach, can you just start out by telling us about your team and your expectations for the season? Well, I feel like, you know, having fought through a couple years of, of trying to develop the program that we're finally in a situation where we go to practice and we're 12, 13, 14 deep with competitiveness and toughness and, and uh, an opportunity to get better every day. Uh, one of the things that's always difficult is you may have three or four good players, but they get fooled in practice by the competition in practice, and, and therefore it doesn't ready them for the games. We have three high major kids sitting out this year, so the competition in practice against the guys who are playing is is raised and, and the standards have gotten much better. But I like this group. Uh, we're 6'8", 6'8", 6'9", 6'10", so we finally have a little size and uh, can actually at least be looking at the neckline at New Mexico State instead of uh, the chest. and. Uh, it's, uh, it gives us an opportunity, I think, to compete and be more physical defensively and rebounding the ball because we've missed enough the last couple of years that if we could have got the rebounds, it would have been more fun. <laughs> but uh, uh, like this group, brought two fifth-year transfers in. One, uh, Dakota Slaughter, uh, came a kid I had at Alabama. And uh, Dakota is a four-point student, uh, dual major, uh, marketing, went to Alabama on a presidential scholar. Uh, award winner and really knows how to play uh, from Indiana and uh, really gives us some exciting depth at the forward spot. Uh, we've got another one in uh, J.J. Thompson who was originally a starter at uh, Houston. Then when James Dickey left, he, he, he left and went to SEMO for a year. Then uh, his, his guy, Dennis Nutt, got fired, so he had a year left and came with us. Hopefully that's not a sign that I'm gone next year. But uh, he, uh, he's really a good player, kid out of Dallas that I think will really help us. And uh, Hines is back. He's gotten some preseason recognition. Guys ask me about preseason recognition, and part of it is just who's coming back. You know, it, Hines was recognized last year, too, going into the season, and what I've told him is, Great to be there, but better to be recognized at the end of the season. And he's had a good summer, though, and uh, looking forward to what he can do. And we added some some new stock with that. So uh, I, I like our depth. We're we've got multiple guys that can play multiple positions, and you know, again, three sitting out. But I think we're at least ten, eleven deep where we have a chance to compete. Uh, you've also added Nick Dixon, who last year. Um, led junior college division two in scoring. Can you talk about him? Actually, Nick did that for two years running. And and when you see him in practice, uh, you see why. He, he's a capable scorer, uh, has great touch, great finisher to rim, understands how to get fouled. You know, anytime you're a high scoring guy, it's not all about making baskets. It's about getting those freebies too. And Nick's very good in transition. And we're really excited about him. He, he's learning how to play uh, with the competition stepping up. It's a different kind of scoring than he's been used to. He's been used to just get the ball and make plays. And of course, with competition rising, he's got to learn how to use screening and his teammates to, to develop that even further. Uh, I, I have to tone him down in shot selection every once in a while, but I like the aggressiveness and, and he's a wonderful kid. And he's shown he can do more things. He, I think he can play some point guard for us and, and uh, uh, like I say, great in transition and, and becoming an excellent defender at the same time. So great story. Came out of high school, didn't go to college, worked in a target score for a couple of years, you know, three years, and then uh, got a chance to play college basketball, had a great career doing it, and uh, but kind of worked his way along. So uh, good kid. Uh, there's a number of rules changes across uh, basketball this season, uh, including 30-second shot clock and expanded arc. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of the rules changes this year and how you think they're going to affect the game? Well, you know, uh, some of them uh, go back to uh, a time that I've lived before, you know, where players had to call timeouts in a live ball situation. The coach could tell them to call it, but they had to physically grab the ball and give the sign. And... You know, that changed a few years back, and I didn't really think it was for the better because to me it, it's a player's game, and, and they should be the ones involved, and a coach could help them along. But 
I, th I think that's a good good rule change. I, I think uh, rewarding defense in in the ten second call going to mid court. Uh, if you're doing a good job and you poke the ball out of bounds or you know you bobble a ball or there's a tie up, that team shouldn't get another ten. And especially at the end of games where maybe you're trying you're a point down and you're you're trying to make something happen and now boom you do the right things and now they can waste another ten seconds on you. So. I think there's some real positives there. <clears throat> again, going back, and again, it part might might be partly my old school stuff, but I, I, I'm not a real proponent of the 30 second shot clock. Uh, I don't think you're going to raise scoring by reducing five seconds on the clock. I, I think you'll increase the amount of bad shots taken, the amount of forced situations that are going to happen, and it makes you look like you're doing something to speed up the game. But but the guys who need to speed up the game are the coaches. Overcoaching is the thing that has mostly, to me, slowed down the game. And maybe that's due to the million dollar contracts that are out there now. The guy needs to act like he's doing something over there uh, during the games. But it just seems like coaches have stopped play more than. Uh, I worked for a great coach at Dayton for a bunch of years, Don Donaher. We score 75 points every night, and there was no shot clock. So is, is the shot clock, to me, one of my concerns with the shot clock is is they're going to be more separation for the haves and the have-nots in some ways. Because let's face it, if Duke has more possessions, they got a better chance <laughs> than I do. So uh, I have some concerns about it because as I watch women's games, I see a lot of bad shots at the end of shot clocks. And now you know it, it's forcing that hand a little bit more. Um, the Vaqueros have a new uh, television deal that will get more of your games on TV. I think you have about 16 or 17 either on um, TWC Sports Channel or American Sports Network or ESPN3. Could you just talk about what that exposure means for your program? Well, uh, again, we're down in the valley uh, and, and in South Texas. And, you know, it's a four-hour drive to San Antonio, five and a half hours to Houston, nine hours to Dallas. So when we recruit in the state, it's a great advantage for us to have a Time Warner package that kids can be seen throughout the state. So uh, great advantage for us because Texas is not a state uh, like I, I was in Ohio for a bunch of years. Everybody could get to your games. You know, two, three hours you were in another state. Two, three hours at our place gets you halfway to San Antonio. So, and, and that's true throughout the state, you know, I mean, you leave Dallas and go to Lubbock at six hours. So uh, really nice thing for the kids we recruit in and around the state. And, and as you know, if it's on cable and it's on, there's a way for people out of state to find it on the Internet or get an opportunity to, to get on satellite and find a way to watch it. So uh, we're excited about it. Another player that uh, you haven't talked about is uh, Dan Kamasa, who last year was named the WAC All-Defensive Team. Can you talk about him a little? Yeah, Dan uh, played 35 minutes a game for us last year as a freshman. Uh, and, and as he knows, that, that was too much, but we were forced into that uh, through injuries and people being out. And uh, now as I've talked to him about Dan, those minutes are great, but now you're going to have to earn them a little more. But uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I mean, he, he had a heck of a year for a kid who got thrown into the mix like that, had to play, had to do things. He became a significant shot blocker, a quality rebounder, and uh, and really, he has some better offensive skills than he exhibited. But I think a lot of it is he was so fatigued all the time that it was it was difficult for him. And you know, kid comes out of high school and gets thrown in those kind of minutes from the background he's from and where he's from. It, it was difficult. But we're excited about Dan and his future. He has one of his fellow countrymen coming in to help him out in uh, Adonis Rabigwi and uh, our second Rwandan on the team. And then we have a Nigerian kid, Chris Iquinebe, 6'9", that are going to help Dan out. But what we'd like to see in Dan, too, is his game develop where he's not just a five-man, but he's becoming more of a four-man and floating to the perimeter because he has good touch and good skills. So uh, excited to have him in the program and, and uh, back and, and developing as a player. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Looking forward to it.